So as I indicated, the last argument for this morning is East Wayne Joint Fire District versus Sugar Creek uh, Township Board of Trustees. Both parties are represented by counsel, so each side will have 15 minutes to present their arguments. The appellant uh, may reserve up to five minutes for rebuttal. If you're going to reserve time, uh, just let me know, Attorney Schrader, and I'll keep track of that and let you know as you get close. As you may know, the arguments are recorded and posted on the court's YouTube channel, so please remain at the podium and keep your voice up. Uh, I can tell you that the court has read the briefs in this matter, and we are ready to proceed if you are. So, Attorney Schrader. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. We have pleased the court. I will not reserve five minutes. Five minutes. All right. I'll let you know as you get close to that five-minute mark. Uh, good morning, Judges Carthy, Lucio, and Callahan, and opposing counsel Chip Comstock. I guess I ought to begin with a bit of a uh, disclaimer. I think it's important the court know that Chip Comstock didn't represent East Wayne Fire District when it was created. Uh, and probably you should know that I became involved representing Sugar Creek Township after the motion for summary judgment had been filed. Uh, with that, um, this is an important case to Sugar Creek Township. In fact, one of the trustees, Mitch Steiner, is in the gallery uh, today. Um, I hate having more than three assignments of error, but I had a little difficulty with this particular case because uh, the judgment entry could actually fit on one page. And this is actually a case that has at least two issues that are matters of first impression, I believe, for the Court of Appeals or for pretty much any court in Ohio. Uh, you'll notice a lot of the citations are to Attorney General's opinions. Um, I find it exciting as a professional when I come across a case that is a case of first impression um, because I think those are fun and it gives us an opportunity to help shape the law of Ohio and provide some guidance to attorneys, local officials, and others um, on Ohio's law. So I want to talk today about two issues, both of which I think are, could entirely be decided on the law and, and could and should re result in judgment for Sugar Creek Township. And those two issues are first, uh, when you look at this, Ohio law requires that there be a cert fiscal officer's certification of availability of funds for any contract entered into by a local government, whether it be a township, county, uh, whatever. When you look at the record of this case, there was never, ever, a fiscal officer's certificate of availability of funds. All of those actually say is that the fiscal officer is certifying that there's either funds available in the government's coffers or sufficient uh, funds in the process of collection to meet the obligation. And that's important. The Supreme Court, as recently as about 10 years ago, and it's a, a case cited in our brief, uh, ruled that as unfair as it seems, if I as an attorney or any other provider, uh, a paver, a guy that paves roads, does the work, but there was never a clerk's certification of availability of funds, we've just been, become the happy uh, donators of our services to the government. It's now, is that when the contract is entered into or when the funds or services are... Expended, the funds are expended. Well, it's interesting that one of the things we cited was an attorney general's opinion that listed every conceivable form of contract and what you needed to do. And the most liberal thing is if uh, it's one that they referred to as a divisible or continuing contract, then you can uh, deal with that by way of appropriating the funds in favor of that particular provider. So in your general fund, for example, you would appropriate money for the paver or for the attorney. You look at the record, they didn't do anything. There's never been a, a fiscal officer certification of availability of funds. Never what, did the budget allocate funds in favor of East Wayne Fire District to, to provide uh, fire and ambulance service. They didn't even do a uh, uh, work order. Uh, work authorization. So we think that's fatal to this contract to begin with. Um, and it's especially, I think, concerning when you have a contract that's something of a springing contract. That is, 
this contract was never effective until or if uh, Sugar Creek was to leave the district. And we've got a whole section explaining some of the other problems that, that occurred with that. Um, but, but that's a very serious concern. We believe that in itself is enough to allow final judgment for the township. Uh, they simply did not do any of the budgetary requirements for such a contract at any time, not in 2015 when the contract was uh, entered into and executed between East Wayne and Sugar Creek, not in 2016, the year they uh, decided to leave the district and voted to leave the, the district, nor in 2017 when they actually did, on January 1, leave the district. Nothing in there about any of those things. The second issue I want to discuss, unless there's further questions on this one, um, involves the district formation. And, and to me, this is kind of exciting. Ohio has, has given a number of ways that a local government, specifically a township, can provide fire services. You can contract with a volunteer fire department, usually a nonprofit corporation. You can have your own fire department as a township. A township can form its own fire district. A township can form um, a joint fire district under 505.371, which is what they did in this case with three other communities. They're down now to two, I think, both of the townships have left. Or they can form a 505.375 fire and ambulance district. Also, there are ambulance districts. So, Ohio has a pretty liberal uh, set of statutes allowing a, a number of various forms uh, of entity to provide those services. But the problem is, you got to pick one. If you want one that's a fire and ambulance district, that you're going to operate with other communities, other townships, other villages, it has to be a 505.375 fire and ambulance district. What they did here, and, and what Appellant's brief does, is basically take all these statutes, of course, must be read in paramateria, so I'm not going to get into that here in a minute, but what essentially they did was pick and choose the parts of a number of statutes they liked and decided that a joint fire district could provide both fire and ambulance services, and they contracted to do that. Here's the problem with that. Number one, if, if you could do that, why would we need 505.375, which creates a joint fire and ambulance district? You simply would not. And I don't need to repeat all the rules of statutory construction to you. You know them. Um, we have to interpret statutes to give them some meaning. If you uh, buy the FLE's argument, there's absolutely no point, meaning, or reason for 505.375 to exist. Why would you need a joint fire and ambulance service if you can do it under the guise of a 505.371 joint fire district? The other issue, and, and most of these were resolved with one sentence in the trial court's opinion, um, is that one of the statutes, 505.375, Four four uh, indicates that a township, that the kinds of uh, entities that a township can contract with for ambulance services, conspicuously absent is a fire district under five hundred five point three seven one. That's not me picking and choosing. It simply doesn't allow that. It's been case law for for years in Ohio that a township can only do those things authorized by statute, unlike a city. Um, the townships are entirely statutory creatures. So unless there's a statute that allows them to contract for ambulance service with a 505.371 fire district, like joint fire district, like East Wayne, then they can't do it. I found it kind of interesting in the appellee's brief, um, he points out that there's a section under 371 that allows a fire district to charge for ambulance services and in bold print, he indicates that, gee, that must be what gives them the right to provide uh, ambulance services. And it's, it's uh, listed as a, like an aha, we got them, we win. Here's the problem with that argument. 
If the legislature is smart enough to allow you to charge for fire and ambulance services and put that in the statute, one would think that if they wanted a, a joint fire district to be able to fire, to provide ambulance services, they'd have added another line that says a joint fire district can provide ambulance services. They did not. So what's the purpose of that line, it's section C, I believe, of the statute? Well, to me, that line adds credence to our argument, and that is, if in fact a joint fire district is not permitted, as we believe the statute clearly says, it doesn't allow them to provide ambulance service, then you better give them the authority to collect money for the provision of ambulance service so they can pay it to one of the entities that is allowed to do that, either an ambulance district uh, or a, a joint fire and ambulance service or an ambulance uh, district. That's the reason that that section exists. It's not an implicit uh, blessing that you can go ahead and, and, as a fire district, provide that which the statute only allows a 505.375 uh, district to provide. Um, the you're at four minutes and 30 seconds, I'm sorry. Okay, and then I'm going to sit down and you want to reserve, reserve that? that for rebuttal. Thank you. Okay, didn't want to interrupt you. You're pretty close. All right, and Attorney Comstock? Yes, you have 15 minutes, Attorney Comstock. Thank you very much. Members, on behalf of the East Wayne Joint Fire District, please report. The township originally filed its appeal arguing that the judge was wrong, the trial court was wrong, that there was a question of fact in this case and argued that there were various questions of fact. And I think the record in this case is very clear that there are no questions of fact. The facts are pretty much uh, uncontroverted. What we have here are unique issues of law. Um, I agree with township and its council that you won't find a lot of guidance in the case law and I think this will require the court's interpretation of the various applicable statutes. There is a distinction in the provision of fire protection in Ohio and Mr. Schrader did articulate, I think, accurately the various options that are available. But it's important to look at the historical uh, background of 505.375, which is the Joint Fire and Ambulance District Statute. Originally, there were joint fire districts, which have provided fire and EMS. And there's been joint ambulance districts, which have provided only ambulances, ambulance service. And what took place was the community saw that they would have two different bodies providing pretty much the same service and wanted to cut down on inefficiencies. So the legislature created 505.375, which was a mechanism to combine those two entities together. And so for a long time, that's the only purpose of that statute was to create a single unit from two. It wasn't until much later that the legislature amended that section to permit uh, a fire and ambulance district, joint district, to be created uh, from the outset. But historically in Ohio, fire districts, joint fire districts, have provided emergency medical service throughout the state. And the... Was that part of uh, the record? Was there information that was provided to the trial court in regard to that, that argument you're making? That it's... it's when you say that argument that it's well, provided throughout the state, mm -hmm. no, that is not in the record. Mm -hmm. no. Could that be an issue of fact, something like that? Whether or not it takes place everywhere else, I don't think so. I think it's just an issue of looking at that statute and, and looking, quite frankly, at 505.371, uh, which is a joint fire district statute, and, and indicating that the legislature included mechanisms for ambulance and emergency medical services billing, number one. And it also says that the top, that the fire, that a joint fire district has the same authority as do townships. 
Townships have the right, and there's no dispute that townships have the right to provide emergency medical services and ambulance services. And so the joint fire districts are given the, that same authority. And in the, the joint fire district statute, the legislature says they have the authority to bill for the provision of their ambulance and emergency medical services. If they couldn't bill for their ambulance, it wouldn't make sense to say you can't provide emergency medical services or ambulance services, but yet you could still bill for it. So, and I know you've talked about this in your briefs, both of you. What was the purpose then of the fire and ambulance district then? Well, as I said, originally it was to combine two separate districts into one, to eliminate it. If you look at it, they have to be of the same geographical district. It has to be the same exact area. That was, and, and it talks about throughout that how to combine them. It wasn't until much later that somebody said, well, we can, we can put together a joint fire and ambulance district initially as a means to bypass having to perform two separate ones and combine them. The, uh, it's also important, I think, for a number of the issues that support both the fact that a joint fire district can uh, provide emergency medical services and can contract with a township. Uh, if you look at Section 9.60 of the Revised Code, which is for contracts for firefighting agency, private fire company, or emergency medical service organizations, that section uh, says that a firefighting agency means a joint fire district. And it indicates that a governmental entity, i.e. township, can contract with a firefighting agency, a joint fire district, for the provision of emergency medical services or firefighting services as appropriate. So we have a specific statute on point, 9.60, which permits the contracting with a township by a joint fire district and the provision of emergency medical services and fire services. And I, I think that uh, is a there's no more direct statute that addresses all of these issues than that one. There's also, uh, and, and, I, and I, again, going through these other issues that the Joint Fire District, both that statute and the statute relating uh, the 505.37 and 371 permit contracting the Attorney General has talked about the ability to contract, and nowhere is there a term or a limitation on the length of the contract term other than in 505.375, the Joint Fire and Ambulance District. And that is the crux of the appellant's argument that the, if, if the uh, were the wrong district, then the contract's too long and therefore it's void. But again, it's 9.60 does not put a limitation on that. Neither does 505.37 or 505.371. So I, I think that you know if you look at the specific statutes on point and, and look at them together, it's very clear that a fire district can con contract with a township for EMS services and, and they can provide EMS services. The other uh, issue that uh, has been brought up by uh, the township is the issue relating to the certification. And I think to, to, to begin with, uh, there's been no, there's nothing in the record that talks about any other contract. The only contract at issue is the contract before this court, uh, the, the five-year contract for services, and that's the one that we need to look at whether or not a, a certificate by the or certification by the fiscal officer is required. This is a case, again, where I think this court just has to look at the plain language of the, of the statute. And, and the starting place is 5705.41. And that, that statute clearly requires a, um, certif a certificate by the fiscal officer. But under section D, subsection D, it says, except as otherwise provided in E2 of a section, in section 5705.44 of the revised code, and so right off the bat, there's an exception found under 5705.44. And then if you go further into that statute, it says, or in the case of a continuing contract to be performed in whole or part in ensuing fiscal year. The attorney general opinions and the case law cited by the township focus on the language of the continuing contract and that second alternative. The, the exception referencing 5705.44 is a recent addition compared to all the case on attorney general payments and go back and address what is a continuing contract. 
So the interesting thing here is where the old case law and the old, the old attorney general opinions focused only on one exception, and that is whether it's a continuing contract. We now have two exceptions, the, the continuing contract exception and the 5705.44. One of the cases that does address it's a little bit more modern is the city cited by, by the uh, township, the city of St. Mary's versus Ogles County Board of Commissioners. And this talks about the requirements for the certification, and it's, it's paragraph 49 of that opinion is cited by the township. But then paragraph 50, which is not cited, says there are several exceptions to the general rule requiring a fiscal officer subdivision to certify the funds. One is located in 575.44, which, which is then quoted. In this case, the key language 570544 discusses when contracts or leases, and we're dealing with a contract, run beyond the termination of the fiscal year in which they are made. The fiscal officer tasked in authority shall make a certification of the amount required to meet the obligation of the contract maturing in such fiscal year. In this case, there was nothing due in the year in which that contract was made. In fact, it wasn't clear when the contract would become would, would become effective and that first payment would become due because it was contingent upon an event being the withdrawal of the fire of the township from the fire district. So the fiscal officer would not know how much to certify in a particular year until that event happened. That event eventually happened. It happened. And the critical issue in this case is <laughs> that the contract was rescinded and the, with, then the, then the district, would, the township withdrew before the fiscal officer could do the certification. He said I, if they had withdrawn, he would have issued the certificate, they actually would have just had to encumber the funds for the following year when that first payment would have been due. That, that's what the requirement is that you would encumber the funds uh, for anything to be payable in the following fiscal year. But the fiscal officer in this case wasn't given that opportunity. And, and they're blaming the fiscal officer, saying, well, you didn't have, you didn't issue anything. Well, there was nothing issued. They had withdrawn the contract before he had that, before they actually um, they withdrew the contract before they withdrew from the fire. From so, you know, I think that uh, we, we talk about a lot whether this is continuing contract or not, but I think the plain language of 5705.4 makes it very clear it's applicable in this case. Um, and that uh, given its reading, the, the district, what, the township was in compliance. They didn't need to be off to issue the, cert the uh, certificate. Again, as nothing was due, and therefore it's a valid contract. I do want to add, though, there is that second exception under 5705.41 uh, about the continuing contract. And the interesting thing is, if you read the Attorney General opinions cited by plaintiff, they actually, uh, cited by the township, they actually uh, support the district's position. Continuing contract is one where each, each year, both parties have an obligation for that year. The, the Attorney General says that a real estate contract can't be a continuing contract because you buy the, you may have payments over the course of the year, but the deed transfers and the property transfers only one time. So it can't be continually, uh, there's no mutual obligations each year to each other. In this case, the obligation of the fire district was to provide fire protection services on an annual basis for a period of five years. It was the district's obligation to provide money for those services. And that, that repeated each year. Each year was a, a continuing obligation of both parties. So by the definition of, of Ohio's case law and its reference in the Attorney General, this was a continuing contract and it, it met the, the additional exception under 5705.41. A little over two minutes left. Okay. Um, the other arguments in this uh, case deal with conflict of interest. I think the record is, is pretty clear in the fact that uh, the board members who voted had no conflict of interest. The only person who did have a conflict of interest voted one time. That contract was withdrawn. Uh, it was... Uh, that was on the 10-year contract? That was on the 10-year contract, correct. And uh, 
the, the, uh, the conflict, the actual conflict vote at that time was actually against the contract. So you know, it's a situation where I think the township is trying to use its own uh, violation of the law in its, in its favor. And last, I, I would just mention that uh, I know there was an issue raised about the conscionability of the contract. I think this district has made it very clear that uh, issues that were not raised uh, below uh, in the uh, trial court are not uh, subject to appeal. And of course, he says he raised them in his uh, reply to your summary judgment. I, I, I did not I did not see that uh, I, I don't uh, agree with that uh, assessment but uh, even if that were in fact the case there's been absolutely no facts or case law uh, cited to this court that would support a conclusion that this contract is in any way unconscionable. Council before you uh, rest I wanted to ask you another question a procedural question okay. um, this was a declaratory judgment action correct is it your opinion that uh, the court um, met its duty to meet all the declarations that were requested under the, yes. under the complaint? Yes, because we, we had asked basically to find the contract two issues, that the contract was was valid and that the, the decision were, and, and that the decision to void that contract or, or withdraw it was, was illegal. And I think the court made uh, those two determinations. So you only asked for two declarations? Correct. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you for your argument. Thank you. Um, four minutes and 30 seconds for rebuttal, Council. Try to take less. Um, Good, then I can ask you a question. Pardon? Then I can ask you a question. Sure. I want to start with uh, eat into your rebuttal time, but Mr. Comstock actually started with something that I had a question about. And looking at the judge's very short um, entry, he said that no issue of material fact, despite defendants' arguments to the contrary, obviously didn't mention anything as to what any facts may or may not have been. Your first assignment of error is that there's issue of material fact, but likewise doesn't set out what those issues might be and seems to go right to the law. Um, both sides here set out their spin on what the facts are, as I would expect you to do. But are there really issues of material fact here? On, on one of them, there is, uh, but it occurred to me, uh, uh, and I don't know why it didn't occur to me before, but it occurred to me when preparing for this oral argument that, that the two issues you could dispose of this case on were, in fact, legal issues. So that part is correct. The, and, and to do a summary judgment, it's not just there has to be a dispute over facts. I mean, if, if you don't have the law, you don't get the summary judgment either. So. That's those two arguments. The dispute is on that last issue he raised, which is the unconscionability slash uh, uh, conflict of interest argument. And uh, on that, what I can suggest to you is in our brief, we cited the specific pages of, of two different briefs that we had filed in the Common Pleas Court where we believe we raised that issue. Now, I didn't do as an explicit or, or precise job of explaining that unconscionability. I know we use the words unconscionability, the court was aware of that. I don't think I was as precise with regard to, you know, what really happened here was you had this board that realized the newly elected trustee was going to change uh, the board's policy with regard to East Wayne Fire District. After January 1, East Wayne Fire was likely to be history. So uh, on the fourth day before they left office, they passed what really was a poison pill contract. And sometimes people want to know why are you really here? And why the township's here is that this contract, you see originally the township was obligated with four other entities to pay contractually for the East Wayne Fire District. They paid 70 grand. Once this contract was entered into, and the reason I call it a poison pill was, in addition to the 70 grand and all ambulance proceeds, the ambulance billing proceeds. Under this contract, then if the township ever passed a levy, then every penny of that levy had to go to East Wayne Fire District in addition to that 70 grand. To me, that's a poison pill uh, contract. So the legal argument as to conscionability was made. I don't think we made the argument as precise as we did in the appellate brief. But um, I hope that answers that. That was a long answer to a short question. The, um, Leave you with a minute and a half. Okay. 
Um, first off, the, the, the reason there's a, uh, the part I didn't hit was the only, and, and I agree with Chip on this, the only time limitation on these contracts by statute is three years under 505.375, and then only for an ambulance, for the use of the ambulance, that part of it. And, and the argument was, gee, uh, on the other side is, gee, well, you know, you're only arguing it needs to be 505.375 for that reason. Well, no. There wouldn't, and the question is, um, from Chip's standpoint, well, why isn't there a similar three-year limit uh, under 505.371? Well, the difference is a, a, a joint fire district under 371 doesn't provide ambulance services. That's what we've been saying. And if it doesn't provide ambulance services, you don't need to limit the duration of those ambulance services. So, um, and the other issue is that at the time East Wayne Fire District was formed, 505.375 was in the form that it is now. And the point is, it should have been formed, and it's not Chip's fault, certainly, he's an excellent attorney, but the fact of the, and he knows what he's doing when it comes to fire districts generally, but the fact of the matter is, this is not a joint fire district, this is a joint fire and ambulance district. It was always intended to provide fire and ambulance services and it should have been formed under 505.375 because it was not, then that contract was void of an issue because the uh, joint fire district didn't have the authority under Ohio statute to offer ambulance services. And again, the notion of just piecing and, and parting these different statutes in order to make a, a 371 entity fit is a problem because if that's okay, we don't need currently a 505.375, and that's something that statutory construction doesn't allow you to do. I think if there's no more questions, I think I'm done. You are thank done. You. Thank you. Any other questions? No other questions. Thank you both for your arguments uh, this morning. Very interesting. The court will take the matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. Uh, the clerk of courts will certainly mail both of you a copy of the decision on the day it's released. And you probably know that the opinions are posted on the Supreme Court of Ohio's website as well. Next.